Okay, good. So we can start now reading the Mandukya Upanishad, verse 8. Pure consciousness, which has been described as having four states, is indivisible. It is Om. The sounds A, U, and M, and the letters A, U, M, are the three states of waking, dreaming, and sleeping. And these three states are the three sounds and letters. But the fourth state, which is unknown and hidden, is realized only in silence. So the very first thing we need to be clear about is that throughout this Upanishad we have been talking about three states and we have designated three sounds to each of these state one sound. That does not mean that reality is divided. Reality is undivided. But it appears in to take the form of three different states. So this pure consciousness is undivided. It merely appears to take these states. What are these states? I don't know who this is, but somebody has... I don't know how to get rid of this person. Having, having some disturbance here. Hmm. Joachim, do you have any idea how to get rid of this issue? Maybe you can just mute all. Maybe you just mute all? Yep. Um, okay. Seems to work. Um. Okay, um, you can hear me? No, if somebody wants to speak, you have to unmute yourself then. Okay, good. So, hopefully we're not going to be interrupted again. Sometimes these little glitches happen. So, we were at the idea of these three states being an apparent, an illusion and there is only one undivided reality. The three states are the waking, dreaming and deep sleep and as you know waking is called a, dreaming or tejas is referred to as u, and deep sleep or praja is referred to as ma. These states have been observed throughout the world and in the modern science or modern uh, world we refer to these as the conscious mind, the active unconscious and the latent unconscious mind. There is still another way of describing these three and that is the concept of bodies. We say that we have basically three bodies. The gross body is called the sthula sharir, that's the gross part that we, are, we know. Sukshma is the subtle part and karan sharir is the causal part. And that which lies beyond this is called para, beyond. Just as everything in this world has these three layers, everything 
the vino of has layers and progress in meditation means beginning to explore these layers going through these layers exploring them and understanding them it doesn't mean intellectually understanding them but knowing them directly just as we experience the mind the body and mind at these three levels so also mantra also has three bodies the body of the mantra is a gross body is the sound itself so if we take the sound om that is the gross body but when you were chanted or, or repeated internally that would be a more subtle version as the mantra goes to the level of feeling deeper emotion that's the karan sharir or the causal level and then it takes you into silence where it leads you to that which is beyond the mind which is known as turiya or the witness so this fourth is not really a state but for a lack of words due to the limitation of language sometimes we refer to it also as a state this fourth is unknown remains hidden and does i endeavor to understand and then know the fourth we will see that in meditation that the, this concept of layers going through the mind is very important for those who are practicing it is important that one progresses through these layers if you remain at an external level which is the sthula sharir or the conscious level then you do not explore the deeper levels and you don't have a comprehensive understanding of yourself you cannot know yourself to know yourself you should know all the three levels and the one beyond it it may appear a bit esoteric this at the moment and that's okay we um, accept that we are um, at the moment have to understand it at an intellectual level but as we go through practice we will begin to make sense of these words sometimes those people who read books they read a text and then they try to put what is in the text into practice now the reality is quite the opposite you don't read things in a text and try to put it into practice what you do is you practice first and then the text will validate what you're doing or rather you validate the text now what this means is that you need guidance you need a teacher you need to be a part of an authentic tradition the oral tradition a parampara yoga parampara and when you are guided along through practices you begin to experience things then when you have questions and you go to your teacher and your teacher might say okay why don't you read this scripture it will help you to understand what you are experiencing and so that scripture will validate your experiences or if you are really <laughs> at that level 
you validate the scriptures and say, yes, the scriptures are right. So this is a process of validation which occurs when one is a part of an authentic tradition. If you only read books and follow things out of books and then try to practice that, you are not going to succeed because you will always misinterpret what is written in the books or in the scriptures. In reality, it's the reverse that needs to be done. You need to practice and then you understand what the scriptures are talking about and you validate that. Does that make sense? Then these scriptures and texts have a purpose. Their purpose is to help those who are on the path kind of a support and a validation. You cannot ever learn anything from a dead text. You can only learn from a living tradition. And that's the difference. So Sri Rama asks, what are the signs that you're progressing through the layers? Who? What are the signs? Well, we will do the following verses to understand that. Um, rather than me telling you, uh, trying to sum, sum it up in a couple of words, we go through the verses and then you will understand whether or not you are going through the layers. To be very honest, almost all meditators or people on the spiritual path or those who say they are on the spiritual path are all at the very first level of the waking state of Vaishvanara. Almost everybody. With a few exceptions. Only those who will really go into deep meditation experience the state of Dhyana. Dhyana is meditation. Only these will understand what I am saying, what I mean by going through the layers. When I use the word Dhyana, I'm not just using a fancy Sanskrit word. Dhyana is a very technical word as defined in the Yoga Sutras. It's become fashionable today for everybody to use meditation. And then you say, I'm practicing my asanas in a very meditative flow manner, you know. So you're basically doing gymnastics, but you say the asanas are meditative. So somebody practices martial arts, which can be very, very violent, very aggressive. You say, oh, it's a form of meditation. Or you're, you're gardening, you're out in the garden, you're gardening, and you say, oh, gardening is meditation. There is some truth to that as well, but this is not the meditation that we mean here. I'm using the technical word dhyana, which means... Allow, going through these layers in the mind, going through them, allowing these things to come forward in a form of purification and learning to witness. This is what <clears throat> is meant by dhyana. So only one who experiences that level of dhyana, which is the seventh limb of Ashtanga Yoga, the eighth is Samadhi, so you're pretty deep into it. So only such a person who is really experiencing Dhyana is really able to go or is going through the layers of the mind. And how does one go through the layers of the mind? We will do <clears throat> now in these verses 9, 10 and 11, which are about these three states of reality. Any other questions before we move on to the next verse?
okay in that case I will go to verse 9 verse 9 the consciousness experienced during the waking state is a uh, the first letter of om it pervades all other sounds without the first syllable a uh, one cannot utter the word om and likewise without knowing the waking state one cannot know the other states of consciousness one who is aware of this reality fulfills all his desires and is successful so this is getting to know the first layer the first layer being the waking state it is unfortunate but it is absolutely true that most of us are not even really aware of this waking state as I am talking and you hopefully are listening there is a lot of things happening around you that you are not aware of sometimes one is not listening carefully and you are not seeing certain signs in people you may be talking to somebody and the person is saying yes but his entire body language may be saying no so our awareness may be only focused on the words and you think oh yes he said yes but you were not aware of the body language of the person which was very clearly saying no it shows that our awareness is very limited so whatever we are aware of in this waking state is very very limited if we are not even aware of the waking state how shall we become aware of all the other realities waking state is not only about what you are doing now in this reality it is everything that comes forward or is manifested here in this birth that you have taken in this body that you have your bearing the desires that you can fulfill in this plane of existence so waking reality is about this level of existence when you die it is like going to sleep the only difference is you don't sleep for one just one night but you sleep for a longer period of time just like when you sleep at night in the morning you get up and you continue your life similarly when you sleep in the sense of dying in the next birth also you continue from where you left off you may not know that you may not understand that but the desires that you had now being carried on or carried forward into the next life and this is why sleep is also known as the little brother or little sister sahodara of death sahodara means little brother or little sister so this waking reality here that we are talking about is 
this plane of existence, that you have a body in this life and you have certain experiences, certain samskaras, they are all going with it. It says very clearly here, without knowing the waking state, one cannot know other states of consciousness. There are a lot of people who believe that they don't need to know all these things. They don't need to get to know themselves. They don't need to meditate. They're just going to jump through everything, skip through all that part and just attain liberation. There are some people who also think that they can dream their way to liberation because they believe this is a misunderstanding that if you can satisfy your desires in a dream then you can live out everything in your dream. A couple of sessions ago somebody mentioned that and said oh I, I if I meet somebody in my dream and I'm happy, does that mean I have satisfied that desire? If that were the case, then you could tell a hungry, starving person to just dream about food and fill his stomach. You cannot. It's, that desire is not fulfilled. It has to be manifested at a, the waking state. So that's not possible. To dream about a Porsche, having a Ferrari, is not the same as having one. So we cannot dream ourselves to enlightenment. And those of us who want to skip all this, skip the waking state altogether. Let me sit in front of the TV all day. Let me watch movies all the time. Let me escape by eating food, um, taking drugs, alcohol, all forms of addiction which have become very, very common uh, in our modern life are forms of escapism, wanting to escape this waking reality. These are not helpful. We need to understand our waking reality. We need to deal with it, live out the desires in a way that is not creating an obstacle in our life. Such a person can then become free of conflicts, which means that his desires are no longer creating obstacles. There is no more conflict. Such a person becomes an apt Apt is somebody who is one-pointed. When there are no conflicting desires between the waking and dreaming state, such a person is so one-pointed that even if he should have a desire, it is immediately realized or fulfilled. So the question is, apart from daily meditation practice, what else can we do to deepen our understanding of the waking state? There are different techniques, different practices besides daily meditation. When we say daily meditation, we mean systematic meditation, uh, preferably four times a day. If you cannot do four times a day, then twice a day. If you cannot do twice a day, at least once a day. Now, besides this, one can practice vichara, which is also called internal dialogue, which is also called atma vichara. And this can be practiced at any time. 
This is basically learning to have a healthy conversation with oneself. The other method is a form of meditation in action in which one practices self-awareness. This is quite different from the idea that most people have about meditation in action. When we generally talk about meditation in action, people are just trying to be aware of what they're doing. So if they are gardening, then they're just trying to be aware of the beauty of the flowers and the plants. If they're cooking, they're trying to be aware of what they're cooking, just to be present. Unfortunately, what happens with this way of practicing is that most of these people are not able to maintain that level of awareness for longer than a few minutes. And the reason is the samskaras come forward. The mind is not been trained. So that does not quite work. When we talk about vichara or meditation in action, what I mean is learning to observe the world around you within a certain framework. And the framework that we have is observing the senses, your own senses, observing your mind, a certain aspect of your mind, becoming aware of that, observing certain emotions, becoming aware of that, Understanding these ideas that have been given to us with a very f f uh, sound foundation of yoga philosophy, yoga darshan, such as the kleshas, and observe this in your own life. This really is very profound practice. It may sound simplistic. It is not simplistic. It is a simple but very, very profound practice. Unfortunately, most people like to have complicated practices. This sounds too simple. And so it is dismissed as simplistic. Most people don't even try it out. So, all of you who are here, you can choose any one of the senses, such as sight, hearing, tasting, smelling, sense of touch, and observe this in your daily life for one week. And by observing this, you will notice many things that come from this. To give you an example, if you're watching speech, speaking is an active sense, you may decide to take up a little practice of mauna, keeping silence every day, perhaps for an hour. If you decide to go for a walk that morning and you're keeping your one hour silence, you meet somebody who greets you. You cannot greet this person back, so you may just nod your head and smile. And you suddenly realize, oh, that was speech. Only that speech did not take place in the form of words but in the form of a nod and a smile. So movement is also a form of speech. And suddenly you have made a connection between movement, which is another active sense, 
and speech. When you do this often enough, you begin to get a lot of insights about how all these different aspects are interconnected. The more you get to know yourself at this waking state, you realize that you are made of cognitive senses, active senses, the antakarna, and as you observe the play or the interaction of these, you begin to understand the waking state. You remember in the very first verses we said here that the Vaishvanara is externally oriented consciousness and it has seven instruments and 19 channels. The seven instruments are earth, water, fire, air, space and the breath, inhalation and exhalation. One can observe that. You see, you get angry and you may notice, oh, my breath has become very, very sh shallow and very, very short. You may notice that you are calm and you observe your breath and you say, oh, my breath is so deep and so fine. The 19 channels include the five karma indriyas, which I have mentioned one, speaking, others locomotion, grasping, reproduction, elimination. The five cognitive senses I've already mentioned. And I said that there's a connection, of course, a very obvious one between speaking, which is a active sense, and the cognitive sense, which is hearing. They are like little, they're like partners, they go together. When you start observing these connections, you begin to get a great deal of understanding into the waking state, because that's what the waking state is made up of. So these, besides meditation, when you turn inwards, in the outward form of meditation, these are the two possibilities. One being Atma Vachara in this form of dialogues and the other being awareness or, or mindfulness by analyzing and studying your own senses and observing them in action. Sometimes you are invited out for dinner or lunch and somebody has a great meal provided, you're enjoying the food, you go out and you may suddenly notice that you're eating an extra helping of the dessert. Even though you're totally full, you're eating an extra helping. You know, you shove, shove one more <laughs> portion of, of the sweets and then you say, oh, that's not me. Actually, I don't even want it. Buddhi is saying, no, don't have it. But the sense of taste, that cognitive sense is so dominant that it cannot resist it. It just wants to have another helping. And then you notice that by becoming more aware of your senses, you are actually becoming also aware of your mind. And so the process continues. Waking state expands from body, from external surroundings to the body and to the conscious mind. Okay, any other questions regarding how to know the waking state?
What does it mean to be successful? Yeah, what is success? When you are able to manifest your desire, you're successful. Everybody has a different idea of success. Somebody wants to be famous. Somebody wants to have a family. So then the person's idea of success is having a, a family, having a nice, happy family. Somebody says, I want to become the CEO of a company. That person's desire is that, then he should fulfill his desire. We experience success when we are able to live out our desires and then we can manifest them. There's a sense of achievement. There's a sense of um, satisfaction. Aishwarya, it is known as. It has also become so kind of common, this misunderstanding that spirituality and the yogic path means uh, somehow renunciation of all desires. Desires are bad things. That many people have a hard time understanding this verse 9. You look at that and you say, one who is aware of this reality fulfills his desires and is successful. Hmm, what could this possibly mean? Why are they talking about desire fulfillment here? And then people get confused because they have created a very strict concept of yoga. Yoga actually to these people mean renunciation, suffering, giving up all joys of life, giving up everything. And... That's not quite it. So we go to the second layer, which is the dream state. Verse 10. The consciousness experienced during the dreaming state is U, the second letter of Om. This is an elevated, intermediate state between the waking and sleeping states. One who knows this subtle state is superior to others. One who knows this in his family Knowers of Brahman will be born. A beautiful verse. This is an elevated intermediate state. Sukshma. I mentioned the word sukshma in subtle. It's a finer state than the waking state. It's an intermediate, intermediate between waking and deep sleep state. When you know this state, you're superior to others. Now, does this mean somebody who knows his dreams is superior to others? I had somebody some years back who would keep narrating his dreams to me. He had a lot of dreams. He was very aware of his dreams. So he kept narrating his dreams to me in great detail. Does this mean that this is a, a, a kind of an advanced meditator? Knowing your dreams is not the same as knowing the dream state. Some of us get up in the morning and we don't remember anything. None of our dreams have no idea. Others may remember a little bit more. Some people are a little bit more aware even during the dreaming, you know, during the dream. But this is different from the dream state. In dream state, the consciousness is inward-oriented. 
It also has the same nine instruments, uh, seven instruments and 19 channels. In the last sessions, we discussed the similarities and the differences in the states. In the difference, we said that if they use the same seven instruments and 19 channels, but all the same, the desires are not fully satisfied there. They, they cannot really play out completely. They can only do this in the waking state. There's a sense of, you know, um, a feeling that they, they're very real, the dreams. It's similar to the waking reality. When you feel pain in the dream, it's just as painful as in real life. If you would lose a loved one in your real, in your, I'm sorry, wrong word, <laughs> real life, what's real. Uh, if you lose somebody in the waking reality and you lose somebody in the dreaming reality, that's equally painful. So the question is, which is real? Which is an illusion? It seems both are illusionary. The only difference is that in one consciousness is oriented outwards and the other consciousness is oriented inward. When you dream, you're unconscious, more or less. It's not the same consciousness, but knowing the dream state is conscious. So, please don't start describing me in detail your dreams. I get a lot of emails from people who describe in great detail their dreams to me and tell me I saw this and I saw that in the dream. Because these are just the bubbles from the unconscious mind and they bubble up. It gets interesting when the dream state or the dream reality comes forward. And that happens only in deep meditation, in dhyana. That means your dream state is coming forward in the light of consciousness. It's difficult to understand if you have not experienced this. And I struggle with the words. The dream state is made up of memories, unfulfilled desires, fears, deep emotions. So all this is a very, very powerful creative force. When you bring this into the light of consciousness, you can channelize and harness a very, very powerful energy, the creative energy, which is in you. You can exploit the potentials of this. It can transform your life completely. This would quicken the entire process of purification. Before that, you're not really purifying. Awareness of the waking state, as I described it, is very good practice, but it is not a purification practice. Purification practice means beginning to understand the dream state. And which is why it says, the one who knows this state is superior to others because he's purified. And therefore, in his family, knowers of Brahman will be born. Because as 
person gets purified, the mind is purified, this person is no longer a human being. This person is becoming or is divine. He's pure or he's becoming pure. And he understands the inner world. He understands not only the outer world, the external world, but also the internal world. And he understands that the laws of these two worlds are different. It's a bit like the laws of physics, which we are bound by in the waking reality. But in the dreaming reality, we are not bound by the laws of physics. In the dreaming reality, you can fly. In the waking reality, you cannot. So the laws of these two worlds are different. And when you know both these states, then you have made a huge big step forward. You are coming in touch with your fears. You're coming in touch with old suppressed memories. You're coming in touch with unfulfilled desires and very, 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 very powerful emotions. And when you purify that, remove conflicts, it means you're becoming one-pointed. It's already a big step knowing this second layer. So you see uh, Sri Ram, that was an answer to part of your question, how do I get to know the layers? Well, if you are at the second layer, you see what this means. It means very deep purification practice where all these suppressed emotions, fears, memories are resolved. And we are not going to kind of, you know, miss sort of miss it and say, oh, it happened and I didn't even realize it. You're going to notice it when it happens. And then you will know that you're progressing. Mostly what happens is those who begin to do the practice and start experiencing some of the fears or some of the old memories, they get a bit scared and, and they stop. If they don't have good guidance, they, they get scared and they stop. In fact, this is very therapeutic and you have to continue. Okay, any questions to that? Viklosh, anything you would like to say or ask? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. We're going to save it up for later. Should it be all good at your end? <laughs> There's a story told, a very nice traditional tale, about a king. The king and his wife, the queen, were sitting at the bedside of their son, their only son and heir to the throne. The son was dying. 
the prince was dying and because he was very sick and there was nothing they could do about it and he was dying. As they were sitting by his side, it was late at night, the old king, he nodded off. He fell asleep in his chair. And he started dreaming. He dreamt that he was an emperor and he had 12 sons and they went to the battlefield. They were fighting and he dreamt that all his 12 sons died in the battle. Just then his wife screamed. He woke up to realize that his only son, the prince, had died. He just died. And he was utterly confused because he, sa he, he didn't know whom to mourn for. And he said, I don't know whom I shall mourn for. My 12 sons who died at the battlefield or this, my only son who has died here now. So real is this state of our dreams that that dream reality is where we live out many of these desires. But it's not enough to live out desires in the dream reality because its nature is different and we need to manifest them in the waking state. Just as this is a plane of consciousness, the waking state, so also the dream state is a state of consciousness, a plane of existence. When you die, you go to sleep. Only difference is, when you die, you don't have a body. When you go to bed at night, you have a body and you dream. But when you die, you dream, but you don't have a body. And that is the state between two births or two lives. And so you will come back to this plane, this waking reality, to fulfill that, fulfill that which you have not fulfilled. So there's a microcosm and there's a macrocosm. So a, uh, you and me exist at the level of microcosm as well as at the level of macrocosm. A question asked by Renu, how can you make use of the waking state skillfully? Well, there are many uh, things and one of them I mentioned was meditation four times a day. If you cannot four times a day, then two times. And if not two times, then at least one time. Apart from that, the complementary practices of internal dialogue or Atma Vichara as well as self-awareness. Besides this, there is also the idea of discipline, leading a kind of a Vedic lifestyle where you eat good, healthy, rajasic food, you have good disciplined habits, cleanliness, all these things, you know. These are things that everybody knows but very few people put into practice. While this will not help you purify and progress in in a in a speedy manner it will help the situation it will benefit you to the extent that things do not become worse so it will prevent you from falling further but for progress one needs to go and understand the deeper layer of the dreaming reality as well. Please remember, once again, I'll just repeat very quickly, remembering your dreams and narrating your dreams is not the same as knowing the dream reality. 
doing a dream reality is very, very profound. It will transform your life completely. Remembering your dreams in the morning does not transform your life completely. Another question is what makes us come back from sleep when we are alive and not make us come back when we die? Well, who said that? I said very clearly that you come back. You come back because you have, exactly because you have desires to fulfill and therefore you come back to this plane. Those people who do not believe in rebirth would perhaps ask such a question. But those who know rebirth, they know that they would come back. So you're saying, oh, to the same body. You don't come back to the same body because the body is transitory, it's transient, and it's broken. When it's old, it's no longer fit for you to live out desires. You cannot use that, bo that body when you're about 80 years old or 85 or 90 years old and you can barely walk. You know what I mean? It's With time it gets more and more difficult to live out desires in, in this body. So, if you have taken care of your body well, it's useful for a longer period of time. But if you haven't, then it's unhealthy, full of disease, and a diseased body is not going to be very useful. I have met people who are very young, but in very, very poor shape, and it's very sad to see them uh, totally unable to do so many things that any normal person would like to do and enjoy their life. So if you're in very poor health and you can barely walk, how, how can you enjoy your life? You cannot. It's very difficult. So as you grow older, you can't hear properly. <clears throat> You know, you get tired quickly, so of course you need to get another body. That's why we don't come back to the same body, we come back to a new one. Because the instrument is no longer functioning. It's like your laptop. After a while it doesn't function anymore, so you get a new one. You may shut your laptop down every night and... Um, Switch it on again, you look after it, you do everything, but still at some point of time it's worn out. It's slow, it's very slow, so you finally have to give it a, a good funeral and, <laughs> and then get a new one. So the instrument is, you know, faulty. Okay, so. Repeat the three bodies of the mantra. I mean, uh, repeating the, the three bodies of the mantra the, makes absolutely no difference. It is merely an intellectual thing. What we need to understand is that you yourself are made up of, of three bodies. And that is waking, dreaming and deep sleep. And the mantra takes you through these three levels if you know how to use it. You need to learn how to use it through guidance from your teacher who will guide you through the three levels which is maybe first repetition <clears throat> then internally then listening and then listening to it go into the silence. So that's how the mantra works. It's more important to understand 
the concept of the layers and going deeper to the next level. That's that's important. But just for information, it's called uh, stula, sukshma, and um, what was it? Karan, Karan Sharir. Okay, so we should stop here and we continue next time. I guess our next session will be the last session for the Mandukya Upanishad. There, next Friday, we will do verse 11 and 12. And when we end the Mandukya Upanishad, we will take a break for a couple of weeks, a short summer break, and come back then again mid-June and start perhaps with the Munda Upanishad, which is one of the finest Upanishads uh, of our tradition, also from the Atharveda. Very, very powerful. Okay, everybody, have a nice weekend and see you next Friday.